to all the people who are attending from all over the country and many parts of the world. To you also, a very, um, a very warm welcome. Um, we hope you're going to enjoy the evening with us. So the evening will be more or less about um, talking around the book, obviously. Um, we have most of the contributors available tonight. So you can tap the you can tap their brains if you want to and uh, pose questions to them. And we are like, we're going to have a general discussion around the book and also about, um, obviously, the future of human resource management within the present context of, um, of this, let's say, new world of work. So um, I used this quote yet earlier this morning when we started the, uh, the conference also, and I, I never thought I will use a quotation from Vladimir Lenin, but nevertheless, he said, um, there are decades that nothing happens and there are weeks where decades happen. And I think we, we all experienced that in, in one way or another over the last couple of, of uh, months, um, year and a half. And, uh, and yet it has not uh, stabilized yet uh, the, the rate of change. So um, we are really privileged tonight to, to launch our book and let me just show you, I've got a copy hot off the press. So this is the last, the last uh, book launch of the year. Um, this book we started, I think, Paul, at about 2019 already, we started to um, have a discussion around the book. And um, we started to farm out some of the, the work and then uh, people had hamstring problems and ankle problems and so on. And um, it never really got off the ground. And that was a blessing in disguise because when we reconvened last year, year around June, we said, listen, uh, the world has been turned upside down. Um, so let's start afresh. And this is the product tonight. And I think it's much more relevant than what it would have been um, the previous round. So um, I'm going to, what I'm going to do now is quickly introduce our, our contributors. And then I'm going to ask Paul to, to give us a, a, a bit of an idea around uh, what the book is all about, the motivation by the book, why the book is important for, for why the message of the book is important for, for the year ahead and years to come. So, um, firstly, uh, alphabetically, but um, my first person I need to introduce is our editor, Paul Norman. He, is, um, he serves as a group chief human resources officer at the MTN Group. He is not is internationally recognized by his peers in the HR fraternity as one of the leading thought leaders in, across the world. Um, I'm not going to go through the full series of every contributor, but I can tell you he's been uh, HR Practitioner of the Year. He's, been, uh, uh, he's received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the SAVP, and he's been the Chief HR Officer of the Year as well. He serves on various boards of uh, MTN and, uh, and so on. Then we have, um, and I'm going to introduce you, in alphabet, as I said, alphabetic order, Vanisha Balgobain. She is uh, currently the executive head of human resources at Exaro Resources. And while I'm doing this, Tina, can you maybe put on the content page for me on the screen? Then people can have a look at what the uh, specific topics are what, that they addressed. Uh, Johan Boertes is um, a practicing attorney and head of employment and compensation practice in uh, Johannesburg of the global law firm Baker McKenzie. He's also, he and his team's, uh, team has won various awards over the years and um, being highly regarded in this specific field. Um, to you also, Jan, and to Vanisha, welcome. Welcome also to Dr. Mark Bussen. Greetings, Bussen. greetings, Wilhelm. All of you knows him very well. He's the, um, yeah. he's the cha chairperson of 21st Century. Um, past president of SARA, uh, written many books for us that we've published. So Mark is the go-to person when it comes to remuneration. Then uh, his partner in crime on that specific in that specific uh, chapter is Daniela Christos, uh, who's an HR practitioner with over six years' experience, written co-written many many uh, uh, chapters to books and so on. And then we have Gideon Duplessis, the general secretary of the trade union. Solidarity, 
um, and head of Solidarity Strategy Institute. He contributed on the IR site, like Johan Gortes. Uh, we have Sheila Goodwin from uh, Media24, where she is head of human resources at the moment. Uh, Media24 uh, is the um, South Africa's leading media business, and, and, and they're in the stable of the Naspers Group. Uh, those of you who don't um, realize it, Naspers is the official money printing organization of the world, so to speak. And then she's also been uh, highly regarded, uh, obviously, was a finalist in uh, Chief Human Resource Officer of the Year Awards in 2019, and uh, is highly, highly qualified, busy with her PhD. Sela Governor is the group head of Talent and Performance at Discovery Limited. Um, hello, Sela, to you as well. And we have Akona Mako, Mako Boka, um, who is currently the employee relations lead for Accenture. Uh, she contributed a chapter in that specific field. And we have the go-to person when it comes to ethics in this country and, and, and increasingly in the world, uh, Penny Smith, uh, Mona Smythe, uh, who is the director of Ethical Ways, uh, which is a niche consultancy focused on the promotion of workplace ethics and integrity. Yasmin Pele is from the uh, software group uh, company, Microsoft, where she is HR consulting for Microsoft Middle East and Africa. There she leads transformation, scale, empowerment and capability, uh, as, uh, uh, capability building, as well as people strategy and planning. That is a mouthful. Hello to you also, Jasmine. Tule uh, Tabuli, Dr. Tule Tabuli is the group human resource executive for SPAR Group. Um, and she's also the member of the executive committee. And um, then we have uh, Dr. Dieter Feldsman. He, he is with, um, he was with M Momentum, but he's now sitting there in the Netherlands where he is um, HR thought leader at Academy of to Innovate HR. Um, he, he has just been uh, elected and awarded the Chief Human Resource Officer of the Year by the Chief HR Officer Association of South Africa. Um, congratulations, Dieter, on that um, achievement. Um, well deserved. And then we have Terry Harris, who is a colleague engagement at uh, Food Lovers Market. She is um, standing for Andrew Molson, who wrote the chapter on a, a purpose um, in that book, Purpose and the Story Around the Food Lovers Market. So, guys, as you can see, the audience that um, they, it, it is um, a, an august um, group of people, um, thought leaders in their specific fields that contributed to, to the book. Uh, Paul, over to you. I want to ask you again, um, as I mentioned initially, we, that, uh, why this book? What, why do we have another book on HR? Thanks, uh -huh. William. Um, yeah, so I, as you say, I mean, there are lots of books uh, on the topic and uh, and many, you know, groundbreaking books, I think. Um, but when we started this conversation, and I guess what was driving me at the time, and as you rightly said, we started this conversation in 2019 before the pandemic, um, technology was already driving a, a sort of a transition in the way HR needed to think about uh, organization. Um, and I think we saw all the changes coming in from the multiple generations and so forth. So, so there was a trend already beginning um, that started sort of, I would call disrupting the, the normal way of work. Um, but I think with that all got accelerated at the scale of knots with, uh, with the pandemic. And I think uh, certainly uh, very, uh, all of us will really agree that the pandemic has disrupted global economies and businesses. And in a way, HR has been at the heart of it. You know, with companies that sort of, I think when we look at it now, as companies are recovering, uh, in my view, I think the role of HR is becoming even more important. And I think part of this is that the pandemic um, it sort of had its inherent effect uh, on businesses, uh, you know, and we, we really felt that. And that was highlighted, I think, by the need for adaptability and resilience uh, towards the workforce. And, and I think that accelerated the shift towards a new digital economy. 
um, and by virtue of that accelerated and accentuated the importance of HR on the new normal. So in many ways, I think the pandemic has highlighted the needs for a more dynamic uh, way of how HR is to work, how we have to see things, and has highlighted a number of areas that I think we have to think about differently. And, and for most companies, um, I think they responded relatively well during the, the pandemic to the challenges and things like that. But it is clear for us now that the old ways of working no longer will serve us. You know, and companies need to be much more flexible and to be able to respond to uh, the, the challenges that face them. And that talks to the ability to be more connected. Uh, that, you know, and, and they, we've seen the unprecedented automation taking place. Um, there's a strong focus, as always has been in business, around, you know, lowering the, the sort of transaction costs of, of doing business. Um, but with that, I think it's highlighted the need for HR to reimagine how organizations should be. And I think that is at the heart of where the book comes in because it's starting to talk to what is this role that HR has to play? How do we, we step into this, this new responsibility? And in a way, uh, you know, those of us who have grown up in HR and in business, we know that old discussion that's happened in many, many conferences over many years, decades, in fact, about how does HR get to the table? How does HR get into the boardroom? And I think despite... Uh, you know, those efforts. HR is right at the center now as, as a result of the pandemic and what has happened. So we're there. And we have to now take up that responsibility to actually move the company forward. And I think what, what, what the challenge that faces us now is how do we build more human systems, more human based organizations, because I think that's the other thing that was lifted up in the pandemic was this idea or a renewed focus on all of us being human and we all in this world together. And I think it's flowed into organizations now and understanding how we need to be different. So, so for me, I think the book talks to how do we build more humane organizations? How do we build organizations where people want to go and work? where they want to get up and where they get excited to go in. And that talks to building inspiring environments, um, you know, and, and all of those things, I think, lead towards creating a more meaningful employee experience, which, of course, then, you know, translates into uh, better organizations. And we see that where great companies have great people. So um, I, I, I think that sort of at the heart of why I think this book is so important for us now. And in many ways, uh, hopefully will be a, a great guide for the HR profession to really shift and evolve the organization to and to reimagine the organization in this more humane sort of way. Yes, thank you for that, uh, Paul. I think uh, it is no doubt that um, here we have a tremendous opportunity for HR to, to um, well, to utilize the opportunity, basically, um, that, that's been posed by this new world of work, the intersection of the aftermath of COVID, uh, the fourth industrial revolution, and to an increase, increasingly, uh, I would say, the, the whole uh, issue around climate change that's going to play a role decarbonizing jobs, and uh, in the South Africa, Southern Africa environment, the socioeconomic uh, challenges that, we, that we're facing. Yasmin, uh, you wrote about the uh, importance of a growth, having a growth mindset, and um, you, um, you told the story about how uh, Microsoft, the journey of Microsoft, um, Obviously, there's no one size fits, fits all. Um, we need to look at bespoke, bespoke models. But if you, if you can take out, say, may, maybe two specific issues that you can recommend to uh, aspects around that, to the, the, the audience, so to speak, 
um, on, on the growth mindset. How can they go about in establishing a growth mindset? Thanks, Wilhelm. And, you know, I could spend a whole day on that one question, but probably the two things that come to mind is, um, I, I think it's got to do a little bit with what Paul has said in the segue to what you have said. It cannot be a copy or a meme of anyone else, you know. So we get together, we have sessions, we engage, we talk, we learn. Today was a wonderful example of that. And the best thing that we can do for each other is to tell the story of our own experiences, you know, what was good, what worked, what didn't work. And through that, um, you learn what you want to try and what you want to experiment with. But but just to maybe get more directly to the question, uh, the first thing is it. it, it it can't be bought, it can't be copied, it can't be memed. You truly have to want to do something and make a change. And it's not a fancy set of changes or a fancy set of tools. It's truly authentically at the heart, what do you want your organization to be? How do you want to be represented? What do those values look like and how are they going to show up? You know, um, I look at it, Quite simply, maybe I'm oversimplifying it, but culture is not a complex organization. And I'm not even sure why we only have culture conversations in the workplace. We have it in our own homes. We have it in relationships, right? And it's about understanding how we want to be, what we need, how to engage, how to respect, how to build, how to support. Uh, so, so the first thing I would say is to understand what that means for the organization. And the second thing that I'd say is, um, it's not a plan or a strategy that we're going to go away for a couple of days and write out and come back and we're going to send an email and have a launch. It's, it's about those everyday changes that we're going to see in each other, the role modeling, the top to the bottom, the entire organization buying in. And, uh, and, and probably the last thing I would say is just really staying incredibly humble you know we all celebrate successes but it doesn't last forever you've got to keep working at it cultures like any relationship you've got to keep listening and giving and taking and supporting and 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 uh, paying attention to the things that matter um so you really need to be humble you really need mm. to be all in and you've got to make sure that you're doing it to together and i think the the pandemic if it taught us anything for those organizations that that believed they had a great culture. What happened to your culture when the crisis hit? And that's probably the best test, right? Did you stay true to who you were or did you end up being someone or something else? Um, so, so probably those are the things I'd call out. Okay, great. While we're on the, the topic of culture, um, uh, Sheila, how important is the culture of of agility and innovation in this in this um, time time and age. Mm. For Hallam, I think um, we, we'd all agree that it's been a time of incredible disruption. You know, we, we we thought we were being disrupted when digital disruption happened, and then <laughs> then it was COVID, and we were suddenly dealing with all sorts of things that we'd never had to deal with before. And of course, agility and innovation are important for that because how else do you figure out how to adapt to things that you've never seen before? How else do you figure out how to do that? But um, I think it actually goes a step beyond that. And it comes back to Jasmine's point about culture and about climate specifically, because being agile, being adaptable, being innovative and being able to come up with new processes, new ways of handling problems that you haven't seen before only happens when you have a specific set of conditions in place. And we sometimes think that it's about having creative people, you know, having bright sparks, clever individuals who come up with great ideas. And certainly you need to have creative people in your business. But if your climate is not right, if your climate doesn't create a space which is psychologically safe, where people can come together and actually be as open and frank as they need to be, share their ideas without fear of being criticized, share their differences without fear of people looking down on them, share their wild and out there ideas without being afraid that somebody's gonna laugh at them, the innovation will never take off. So one of the things that we've found and certainly one of our big lessons from moving out of being in an office where we could see everybody every day into this kind of remote set, remote work setup that most of us have gotten used to and having to make major organizational changes at the same time, having to do things that had never been done before in our industry, never mind in our organization. Um, the one thing that really sustained us and carried us through was this ability to create a climate where people felt safe to take risks, 
and people could do that feeling supported and being innovative. So for me, I think the one big take out is that um, everybody can be creative. Everybody has that ability to be innovative and to come up with new ideas, but not everybody's going to share them with you. Not everybody's going to share their creative ideas with you and not everybody's going to work together to bring those creative ideas to fruition. If you don't have the right climate, if you don't have safety in your climate, then you're not setting yourself up as an organization to actually take advantage of what you need to. And certainly it's the only way to survive. Of course, we have to be innovative. So I think for us and for me, the exciting thing about being in HR is that we are so part of working on the climate of our organizations. It's in our domain. This is the stuff that we know. This is the stuff that we do every day. And we've really seen demonstrated, particularly in the last 18 months, how much it really matters to getting great business results. Mm, fantastic. Thank you very much. You know, uh, years ago, somebody told me, uh, uh, HR director there in the US, he said, uh, or what I call assistant pre uh, president of HR, he was attending a session of Edgar Schein, or Edgar Schein was speaking at this conference, and, uh, and obviously talking about co corporate culture. But this uh, uh, vice president HR brought his CEO with him, his president of the company. So halfway through this presentation, the this president turned to the HR guy and he says, listen, we, you must get us some of this culture stuff, please. So um, that brings me now to Terry, I see you smiling. Let's talk about the purpose stuff. Um, the, 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 the chapter in the book about uh, Food Lovers Market and the importance of purpose and the journey that you've that you've uh, followed there as a case. Um, I'm not. I don't want you to repeat that, obviously. But one or two pointers for companies that want to make sure that they that they deliver on purpose, that they are becoming a purpose-driven organization. Um, one or two ideas from your side. Cool. Thank you. Um, yes, that was funny. Uh, look, I think the first thing that you really need to look at um, when it comes to purpose is. It's not something that you can read on the internet and go, cool, I think that's a great purpose. Let's go with that. Um, it's really a part of reflection um, and digging deep within the organization and, and digging deep within everybody who works in that organization in terms of what does that mean for you? So I would definitely say the first thing is looking at a higher purpose and what is it, you know, I did say in the presentation earlier, it's not really about what kind of business do you want to create? It's what kind of world do you want to create? Um, and I think go from there. The second thing that I would say is really looking a lot more internally about um, what is driving us. So um, if you're coming from a place of love or if you're coming from a place of fear, it will really help to dictate what kind of behaviors you have within your business. So I think the first thing that you would probably need to do is really start delving into that um, and kind of have that as a conversation that goes on within the business. You know, I know it's quite difficult and a lot of people kind of steer away from emotions when you're in a business context. So that for me would be the two biggest that I would say focus on first. Yeah. Great. Uh, to the audience um, sitting there, wherever you are, you're welcome to pose questions also to the panel if you want to comment and uh, be part of the conversation. So Penny, um, in, in a, this is a sea change that we're going through and it'll continue. There's no doubt about it. And probably uh, pick up speed. So um, the, the, if, the, if the organization's DNA is not built around uh, integrity and ethics, then it's so easy to, to uh, go haywire. Um, what is your take on the importance of ethics and integrity and governance when it comes to, to this new world of work? Uh, thanks, Phil, Helm, and uh, the other panelists. And I think on behalf of the um, contributors, we're so thrilled with, with the, the people who have joined us this evening. Um, thank you. It seems to me that it's absolutely essential to organizational sustainability. We've seen repeatedly in our own region and the world um, over that uh, reputations are being destroyed through ethical failings. One of the things that's very interesting in the period prior to the onset of COVID-19, we saw for the first time the fact that um, the 
single largest reason for the dismissal or stepping down of CEOs had shifted from financial failure to ethical failure. That's in terms of global trends. Um, we do understand that there was a kind of a freeze for a period of time, and we've seen that trend energized and moving even faster as we see organizations, their directors, their board members, their leaders um, falling by the wayside around ethical um, issues relating to their personal lives, as well as to, of course, their organizational leadership. Um, there's this um, saying, there are various versions of it that says the reputation of a thousand years um, can be destroyed in the course of just one hour. We're seeing organizations um, that are now a shadow of their former selves over the conduct of a few people over a short period of time in just one part of the business. Um, most of our uh, audience today um, are from this region. And one of the things that's a big risk to all of us is that we tend to judge ourselves against the norm. If we're in a situation where the norm appears to be declining or the norm appears deficient, and that is certainly the case with the spotlights on corruption in our region, the world as a whole, but in our region specifically, we run this risk um, including as HR practitioners, that we we don't have an eye on what is a almost tidal wave of compliance regulations um, coming at organizations. And I don't mean compliance in respect of um, basic conditions of employment. I want us to be saying we need to be taking um, our delivery um, at compliance in those areas as an absolute given, which is something that Paul um, said in his start this morning. And to say that there are major social shifts, people's expectations, customers' expectations, these are being um, codified into law. And as HR, we need to help our organizations be responsible, for example, and responsive to the enormous ESG uh, challenges that are facing us. At the end of the day, what we have to comply with becomes something that organizations, people's behavior needs to comply with. So today there's this whole array of disciplines outside of human resources that we can call on um, to help us ensure that people not only comply, but do so willingly. Um, so in this chapter, um, I tried to pull upon social anthropology, uh, anti-corruption legislation, uh, some cognitive science, and um, really talk about the fact that in HR, we've got the opportunity to be the organization's behavioral scientist, and in that way to deliver uh, consistently ethical conduct um, and ensure in turn the sustainability of wow. the business. Wow. Thank you very much for that, uh, Penny. Now, I'm, I'm, that is a very comprehensive chapter uh, with a lot of uh, guidelines and also resources that Penny lists there that you can access. Um, thank you for that. Uh, Vanisha, well, so digitization is, um, is driving a lot in terms of business and the future of business. <clears throat> and it calls for tremendous lot of upskilling and reskilling and your chapter deals specifically with the, the, the importance of learning and development. And you focused on, you applied it also on, on Xara. But um, in, in brief, uh, what are the two, three major trends that, um, uh, that impacts now L&D in, in, in the world and South Africa specifically? Um, well, <clears throat> sorry, I'm not too well, so my voice is a bit husky, so sorry about that, but uh, good evening to everyone on the call. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. It was an absolute pleasure to be part of this um, contribution to this book, so uh, to have excellent people on the call and the contributors as well. Um, I think for me, uh, Bilalem, you know, coming from the mining industry, um, it's, it's very much more challenging to work on the different levels in the organization. 
to ensure upskilling and reskilling, not only within um, the context of the organization, but looking beyond the impact of uh, just your employees. Um, we also take on a lot of contractors uh, where people reskilling becomes quite critical in terms of the domain of the mining uh, context of safety. Um, so apart from your compliance uh, piece, you also talk to, for instance, your safety piece uh, and how that fits into reskilling and upskilling together with a youth development in the communities that we work in um, and trying to preserve jobs um, at the end of the day. Um, globally, trends are in this uh, piece of work on people development is really around, and I think some of the contributors together with uh, Paul touched on how quick organizations were able to adapt to changing the face um, with, uh, with the pandemic, pandemic that has been brought about. And I think that has increased the virtual platform for people development. Um, it has created not only people to start taking much more ownership for their uh, development, but also finding different ways and means uh, through their organization and outside their organization to upskill themselves because this became the part of becoming employable. Um, when, when the business has started to uh, reduce their, uh, their costs, during uh, the pandemic. And I think um, to, I think it was J uh, Jasmine that said, you know, um, are you true to your values and your culture? And I think that becomes so critical with people development uh, and where do you actually cut the costs? Um, and it talked to livelihoods of people and how that plays into the whole people development space. Um, in terms of where organizations fit. And we know as HR practitioners that, you know, we do have a place at the table. However, the real core of seeing whether people uh, really want to be part of your organization is the employee experience you create for them and the role of leaders and mentors, because that also plays a role in how people are given that opportunity to actually develop. Um, and, and I think that's, for me, the heartbeat of organizations is to understand and be part of not only HR practitioners, but creating leaders with that mindset that they are very, very huge in the role they play in ensuring people develop and, and exciting themselves and creating that purpose in the organization. So, so Willem, I think it's really for me, the culture, the experience you want to create and how do you take it to the floor uh, of creating different careers, redefining roles and ensuring that people can take ownership for their careers um, uh, in the role of developing themselves and ownership. Yes, that's great. Um, guys, can I ask you, uh, for, the, for the audience purposes, um, you can order, I think Tina did uh, post, the, um, post the, uh, the, the, the link to buy the book. There's a special on the book until, I think, the weekend, Monday. So um, utilize it. There's a 15% discount. The, the courier charges were reduced radically to assist people to buy as many as they want. So, so this is the ideal opportunity to buy yourself a nice Christmas present and everybody around you. And by the way, upskill um, everybody in the process. Dita, you and Annette uh, wrote the chapter on uh, wellness and, uh, and so on. So before COVID already, I'm going to focus quickly on mental health. Before COVID, it was already a problem. We saw um, <clears throat> anxiety, stress, um, all the indicators going up consistently. Uh, during COVID, we've seen it spike even more, and it's not coming down at the moment, according to the latest research. What can companies do? Um, what are the two, two to three things that you think um, people can, companies, organizations can do to alleviate the whole issue at the moment? Okay, good, after, good evening, everybody, and, and thanks, Valalem. Um, I think 
Valerum, your point around the fact that your mental well-being and holistic human well-being has been a conversation even be, before COVID. I think we need to acknowledge that, that there's always been, unfortunately, in a lot of organizations, certain stigmas attached to well-being. Um, a very reactive approach from a lot of organizations. And to be very honest, a lot of people not utilizing things like you know, employee assist assistance programs, et cetera, just due to the stigma that came with being mm. part of those typical programs. I think where the future lies is really in almost the opportunity that COVID created for us to rephrase and rethink what well-being is within organizations. And I think Paul and a lot of the other authors have also spoken about well-being being integrated into concepts like purpose, like Terry spoke about, Sheila spoke about culture. Um, well-being needs to be incorporated into the broader domain. And I think organizations need to do a few things. The first one is well-being has to be a multi-channel, multi-facet approach which means people need to be able to consume well-being services in the way that is comfortable for them, where they feel trusted and where they feel safe. And I think that's a very important point. The second piece is I think we need to extend our definition of what well-being means. Um, I think we are still very focused on, you know, I think on the one side, physical well-being and mental well-being. I think that stretches a little bit further. And I think a lot of organizations are going to go into a season now where they are going to have to deal with trauma because people will start suffering from trauma post COVID around what they've lost, where they are now and why things are not the same. And as we adapt to hybrid working or distributed workforces, I think well-being becomes really the glue that holds the organization together and really ensures that sustainability. So I really think those are the things, multifaceted approach, make sure that you remove the stigma around what well-being means and what well-being implies and then bake well-being into the organizational DNA and purpose as part of what you are and what you stand for, not as something that you just do when something has gone wrong um, to respond to a crisis already in need. Um, and I think those are the things that we have to put on the table in our conversations as HR. Now, I just want for the audience to uh, say uh, that chapter that you and Ninette wrote on um, an, an example of the case study of momentum is very valuable for other organizations to have a look at and bench best practices, uh, to look at that best practice specifically. Um, I just want to see where my friend, Cello, um, the whole issue around talent management um, and bringing in artificial intelligence in, in assisting and um, the role that it's playing. Um, how is that going to revolutionize ta talent management? Uh, good afternoon, Valerum and colleagues. So uh, first of all, well done to all the contributors and to Paul. I think uh, excellently, um, you know, excellent uh, contributions all around. Um, I hope you can hear me because I'm actually staying true to my chapter and I'm actually very agile. We lost electricity, so I'm uh, using a mobile device to connect to you. So uh, true to, to agile and the new world of work. Um, we're experiencing it firsthand this evening. Um, so in terms of talent management and how artificial intelligence is playing a role, um, what we are seeing and what uh, you know, I've articulated in, in the chapter is that um, there's a lots of technologies that are prevalent uh, in, you know, in many uh, facets uh, contributing to revolutionizing you know, the way we see our people practices. Uh, but where we see this make a huge difference is uh, when it comes to being more efficient and effective in identifying uh, the right talent and making sure that we're able to uh, match the right talent with the right skills uh, to uh, the right opportunities. So from a talent perspective, it's really revolutionized the way we're looking at, uh, at how we uh, source for talent, how we attract talent. Um, including how we look at uh, performance and development, uh, which I think is, uh, is where the artificial intelligence plays a, a role. And it is really about um, trying to understand, you know, the, uh, the experiences at the end of the day that we want to create for our end users or employees and our customers. But really how AI plays a role is it, it's helping us uh, to be uh, more efficient and effective in, in enabling uh, us to connect with talent as well as talent to connect with us. And it's doing it seamlessly uh, through the use of this uh, uh, algorithms that's used 
uh, to be able to connect us with the talent or, uh, or the talent connect um, you know, seamlessly with us and our organization's culture, values, uh, being able to also then match that talent um, into the right opportunities at the end of the day. Uh, the other bit is as much as we accelerate the use of technology and AI and automate and digitize, uh, the important for us, bit for us as HR professionals is to remember that there's a human at the end of this. So as much as we use technology to digitize and automate, we must still try to maintain that human connectedness. And so AI also helps us to understand then uh, how to connect uh, with talent and employees um, you know, from an experience perspective in an in a inspiring way. So uh, there's a number of benefits of using AI, but at the same time, I'll encourage us to make sure that in those moments that matter, you know, in the people uh, experience value chain, that we make sure that we try and maintain that human connectedness and social connectedness at the end wow. of the day. Thank you very much. So the audience can, can hear from the, the contributors so far that there's an incredible richness when it comes to to uh, this book and the chapters that, it, that the content it carries um, and that it's cutting edge stuff. I wanna move on to organized labor and industrial relations, employee relations. We've seen now um, quite a number of strikes here in South Africa and the promising promises of, 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 of industrial action. And um, we've seen that also in in the US, for instance, a couple, uh, for the first time in a quite a bit of long time, a long period, there's, there's a quite a substantial uptick in strike action. Um, demonstrations around the vaccination in Europe and so on. But um, at the same time, we have more automation, uh, <clears throat> individualization, uh, specific needs and so on. So I want to ask, uh, Johan and Akona and, um, and, and Gideon specifically, um, what's your take on the future of industrial relations? Akona, you can focus more on the, on the ER and I'm going to, on my screen, Johan is first coming up. So Johan, if you can maybe kick off and then uh, Akona and then I'm going to ask Gideon to close that argument around industrial relations. A pity Professor Eddie Webster is not here with us tonight. He wrote an excellent chapter on the importance of um, of, of, of the informal sector and um, the gig economy, what um, in, in terms of organizing post COVID uh, with regard to that, but oh, he's unfortunately not here tonight. Um, Jan, over to you. Thank you very much, Valhalla. Um, and uh, let, let me say that from an employment, uh, employer's employment perspective, uh, the, the way in which the we see industrial relations moving and employer relations moving um, in the collective side is that you know there's a, there's significant pressure on trade unions and organized labor to remain meaningful and add add value. Um, there's a number of factors that impact on um, individualization. Employees we're talking talk about the Spotify effect. You, know, you don't have to suffer that much Spotify rates. Um, new playlist individualized to you. Uh, you want me, your, uh, sorry, on to, to, to barge in there, but you no, uh, no, no. sound you're break, breaking up quite a bit. Okay, I'll tell you what, let me, let me just get a better spot. Um, no, unfortunately, maybe if you put your video, uh, your, your video off, then it might be better. Yeah, it may be better on a number of fronts, you know, and then people don't have to look at my no, as well. Right? <laughs> no, I was not uh, implying uh, anything. Numerous <laughs> benefits, numerous. <laughs> okay, how, how, about, how about this? Is the, is the sound better now? The sound's better, yes. Okay, excellent. So let's do that. So um, we, we talk in the book about the Spotify effect, you know, where you have the ability uh, through algorithms or uh, rhythms on, on an app you know, to get a new playlist individually tailored for you every single day. And this is the, the, the life that our new generation of employees are experiencing. So the Gen Z's, they, they, they want to be treated like an individual. It's that old adage of, you know, don't treat people the way that, that you want to be treated, but treat them the way that they want to be treated. They want to be treated differently. 
Oh, my yarn. It's not working. It's not working. I apologize. Let me, let me take it, hand it over to the sit and I'll try and find the desktop and sort out my sound cooking. Okay, let's do that. In the meantime, I'm going to ask uh, Akana if you can maybe uh, provide us with your input around uh, how you perceive sure. the em employee relations. Thanks in, for uh, him. Um, using this. I wonder if I won't encounter the same issues as Johan. Perhaps he's having issues because uh, it's storming quite badly. And sometimes it tends to kind of affect. Yeah, um, yeah the Are you fine? let me know if you can't hear me 100%. So I think Johan was really starting to talk about uh, the IR space and, and you'd ask the question around unionization. And I think if I start looking at, at the ER component and, and I look at, uh, you know, what each one of our speakers has said today, um, just on this very call in terms of, you know, the different aspects that need to be taken into account, whether from a mental wellness perspective, uh, et cetera, in terms of, you know, integrity systems in the business, in terms of empathy, you name it. Um, each and every one of those aspects is generally tied together in an organization through some type of policy, right? If it's not a policy, it's a guidance document. Uh, what you wouldn't want is uh, almost a laissez-faire approach where each and every kind of manager adds their own interpretation to what it is that they see which may very well not be aligned to what the values of the business uh, you know, actually are. And that's the type of stuff that starts to lead to a lot of litigation and the like. So I think that the gauntlet is really thrown down um, and, and COVID has accelerated that to a massive degree. And it's got us as employers asking pertinent questions insofar as our policies, insofar as our practices, insofar as looking at whether what is in place is actually sufficient um, to cover all of the relevant aspects in terms of where we find ourselves. Um, I don't know if two years ago, a lot of businesses had policies that uh, were as robust as what they probably have now in terms of work from home. Um, I'm not entirely convinced that there would have been a lot of people in organizations that can answer the question in terms of if I'm working from home and I slip and I fall and I break my ankle, will it constitute an injury on duty or not? Um, you know, those, those types of complexities, right? What, what, is, what, what needs to happen in terms of, of mental health? A lot of companies had robust policies. If I happen to get in a car accident and I'm incapacitated for a month, there's a myriad of processes and this person gets involved and that person and paperwork, et cetera, et cetera. But nobody really thought too much around the mental health aspect, which then started to become kind of a head and shoulders, um, you know, at the forefront in terms of everything that we were dealing with. So there's a fundamental um, aspect in terms of what brings it all together. Um, and, and, and that sits in that policy space. Now, if we put that aside in terms of where the thinking needs to be, we start talking about the gig economy. Uh, I don't know how many organizations have any other type of contract besides your standard, permanent, I'm working 40 hours a week no. or 45 hours a week, Monday to Friday. I don't know if anybody's even thought around what happens at the point that I need to bring a freelancer into the business. And if I do bring the freelancer into the business, is that person going to be subjected to the same rules as an Akona who works a normal eight to five? What if the freelancer is working for five hours and has another job um, on the side? Um, are we going to say that, well, you've come into Accenture, therefore you cannot render services for a competitor? Um, what does that mean in terms of that person earning a livelihood? And again, if you're going to put in a restraint of trade to say you can't go work for a competitor, when the court starts to scrutinize that, will that be reasonable? Or will you then be encroaching on that key territory in terms of um, unduly affecting my ability to make a living? So. There's a lot that needs to happen in the thinking space uh, for us to get ahead uh, of what's coming down the track. And I think from a union point of view, um, not to encroach on what Johan is going to, and, and Gideon are gonna talk about it, but it's around saying that whilst the space is a little bit precarious in so far as unions and, and how they are grappling and dealing with this new world and digitalization, et cetera, et cetera, we, uh, employers must be very careful to not unduly use that gap to break communications with the union um, and to not talk to union members and not talk to the employees because when things start to settle down, they're gonna find themselves in a very dangerous position where trust uh, and communication structures have been eroded. Uh -huh.
Fantastic. Those are very, very valid points. Um, thank you, Akona, for your input there. Um, I want to, uh, Gideon, on your side, the, 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 the recent and the ongoing uh, industrial action and trade union movement uh, uh, strike action, is, are we talking about, a, a, is this a, a dead cat bounce or is it a renewed energy and uh, future for the trade union movement? Well, I don't know why it's very exciting. I think it's the great reset and it's not going to happen overnight. But we've seen, you know, prior to COVID, there was this build up in tension and, and there was a lot of focus on collective issues and on job security. And suddenly, uh, Industry 4.0 managed to fast track the way that we as unions need to position ourselves, the way we communicate with our members, the way that we have to interact through virtual means. Um, so there's a lot of things that we, and, and suddenly the way that we had to adapt, we can now uh, look at Generation Z and the millennials and be more attractive to them because we became cyber unions, all for those of who managed to adapt. But the thing is, the health and safety became such a core issue now. And the, and the focus shifted also from safety to health, where health and mental health came in. And that health platform is such a wonderful platform because we're the trade unions and employers had to share so many platforms regarding health and safety issues. It's a, it's a neutral territory, we're on the same side. And suddenly the relationship between the mining union started to improve because uh, you know we are on the same wavelength, it's not a competition. Uh, we want workers to return home safe, the employers, we have a same collaborative approach. And, and the thing is pluralism um, in, in the sense that the union uh, um, tension around membership growth and competition is, is now something that I can see it's, it's, there's a shift. And even in the wage negotiations, the whole collective bargaining model is starting to change. The focus is on the social wage, in other words, health and safety and medical aid and pension fund and, and, and skills development. Skills development is now key for us to focus on uh, in terms of the industry 4.0. So yeah, so it's a major disruption, much bigger than Marikana. And yeah, I'm very excited, you know, uh, and, 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 the, and the direction we are moving because the country mm. needs stable labor relations as well. Mm. Mm. Thank you, uh, Gideon, for that input. Um, and it's quite insightful to be quite honest. Johan, you were busy with talking, uh, I think the last time you broke up was about when, when we, you talked about the algorithm and, and Spotify, uh, which I yeah. found in the book uh, a fascinating story uh, or viewpoint. Can you uh, maybe elaborate again? No, th thank you. Thank you very much, Bella. I trust this, the sound is better this time around. Perfect. Excellent. Excellent. So the Spotify effect, this is so exciting. And I urge um, the, the, the listeners and the um, participants to, to go and look up this whole issue of the Spotify effect. But essentially, it talks about individualization. It talks about how do you individualize an experience for a user? And we find that in the workplace as well. People don't want to be treated, you know, as part of a large collective or group anymore. You know, they want the individual needs to be addressed. Everything we do in the workplace or in, in, our, in, our, in our daily lives is about individualization. You've got a, a private banker. You can go into an app. You can get all your stuff sorted out. You know, you don't need to be part of a group in order to have things done. How does this translate itself into your industrial relations climate and your employer relations strategy? If you are still relying on the same indicators that you did 10 years, 20 years ago in order to determine the, the employer relations climate, you are missing the trick. If you are going to look at things such as um, number of days lost due to strike action, number of grievance files, number of disputes files as an indicator to say we are doing well on the employer relations front, you are missing the boat because employees what we are finding are not using those traditional vehicles and mechanisms in order to show their disgruntlement. They either just walk, uh, vote with their feet, you know, those key talent that you are desperately trying to, to retain. Alternatively, they make use of social media campaigns. You know, um, we have had a number of our, our global clients who've been the subject of this sort of uh, mass campaigns, where all of a sudden you've got a social media outage you know, and a whole outrage being orchestrated to, to drive um, issues of employee disgruntlement and where that intersects then with community issues. Um, so this is the new way of, um, of, of, of work and how this impacts on the employee relations strategies within the workplace. So what we do in the book is we try and give some practical guidance on what are those things that you can do differently? What is it that you should be looking at? How do you create meaning uh, for yourself? How do you treat them like individuals? And we also just touch on the on the legal landscape, you know, and what are those things that we think we can still do better and where we can change. 
you know, um, in order to, to, to deal with this wonderful and exciting and magnificent change that we're going through. Thank you for that, John. Yeah, I think that's a fascinating story. Uh, Tuli, um, talking about individualization, and uh, Paul has also written quite a bit about it and made the point very strongly in, in, in his chapters. Um, <clears throat> now, how important is um, individualization when it comes to engagement and, um, and yeah, the whole issue around social capital, maybe? Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity. So, Valhallam, uh, I think for me, what is important in terms of the social capital is to actually understand and acknowledge the fact that our people, and it is not just a cliche, are actually uh, who drives the strategy. In any organization, it is the people who do that. And so, in essence, it's about putting people at the center of organizational strategy because they are the ones that are responsible for bringing strategy to life. So social capital is about making sure that those relationships that are important in an organization are actually in place and therefore worrying about uh, engaged employees, making sure that the employee experience in an organization is a positive one creating that sense of belonging is very important because if one looks at a number of types of capitals that we employ as companies, you know, your, um, your technology, your products, or even your services can be copied overnight. And in fact, the person who's copying them could actually even do a better job than yourself. And the one thing that people cannot copy is actually your stuff. And the answer being very simple. The employees that you've got are the only form of capital that is actually sensitive to its environment. So even in instances where your competitors were to come and poach your high performing uh, team members, well, that would be uh, an illusion that they've got. But the reality of it is that that employee, when they find themselves in a new environment, if that environment is not conducive to performance, if the company culture does not allow them to actually become the best that they can be, if there is no teamwork, the once highly um, skilled person, highly motivated person will actually get despondent, will become very frustrated. And as it goes, if you cannot beat them, you end up joining them. Or at times you might even find that they will actually resign because they are frustrated. Because the reality of it is, whilst you can copy the technology and the products and the services, you cannot copy the culture. You cannot copy um, the, the, the essence of an organization. So it is about making your employees their competitive edge. It's about making your staff the living strategy because that living strategy can never be copied. And that is actually what social capital is all about. It's about capitalizing on your people. It's about being intentional about whatever you do when it comes to making sure that you create a fertile environment for your people to thrive, for your people to actually drive your strategy, for your people to actually be the ambassadors of your brand. Mm. Julie, uh, thank you very much for that. You, you mentioned capital, you, the, 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 your people are your, um, my, well, you mentioned only capital or most important capital, but money is also part of the game. So that brings us to, to Mark Bussen and, um, and to Christella. Um, guys, are we, and Daniela, you, you can, both of you can, can, either one of you can, can talk actually, but is our remuneration practices and maybe more the philosophy around the remuneration is that fit for purpose when it comes to the new world of work hi well Helen and greetings daniela welcome it uh, is not that's the short answer um our systems are too rigid we write a job description and put you in a box we have one job grade, and if you do something a little bit more, a little bit less, you want to be regraded. 
you have a pay scale and it is uh, rigid and there are rules around where you must be. And, and in Agile and work from anywhere, we need a lot more flexibility. So um, our policies are being rewritten at the moment to accommodate that flexibility. Our grading systems are being slightly broad-banded. Our job descriptions are moving to role profiles. So it describes a role and the impact and outcome, not just the uh, activities. And um, our remuneration policies uh, and, 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 and the way our REMPOs are working uh, are changing daily. So for me, it's probably the most exciting time uh, ever since I've been born. It, it, it hasn't, it hasn't nothing, nothing has had such a big impact as this. Right, um, Daniela, do you want to add? We, we have a storm here in Johannesburg at the moment. It, that there is a picking. storm here, and I can't escape the rain. Everyone is just so loud up here. I hope you can hear me. Uh, uh, I'm going to swim just now. So, no, uh, uh, Mark, thank you very much for that. I think you're spot on the, um, that it's just too rigid, uh, rigid and, and so on. Guys, I, I think <clears throat> for the audience, like, you, you get an idea. This is just the tip of the iceberg of what's covered here in the, in, in the book. We have a fantastic chapter from Professor uh, Kurt April around diversity inclusion. Um, he's probably the, the go-to person today when it comes to diversity inclusion. When he, uh, so, so it is cutting edge stuff that he discusses there. Um, and uh, some other chapters as well. I'm not going to bore you with that at the moment. So that gives you an idea what the book is all about. Um, I think as a roadmap, uh, entering the future, the next couple of months, years in, in the country, we have an opportunity. If we have an opportunity to catch up uh, when it comes to HR and um, in terms of our comp competitiveness in the world, um, we must just grab this opportunity. Paul, I'm going to give the last um, word to you. Um, you've listened to everybody. What's your take? And uh, a, a, a word here, yeah, we, as we're entering the last sort of 50 meters of the 800 meter race, of 2021 give us some inspiration and hope to, to to finish this last 15 meters strongly and start the new year with uh, hope um, over to you thanks for them well firstly let me just thank all my fellow contributors you know they're all experts in their fields and in their areas and making a great impact in the work they're doing so it's a real privilege to have this combination and I think uh, the book itself, uh, I think, gives a good framing for all of us to really understand the challenges that we face. Um, and I just want to encourage everyone, you know, to, to step into this world. We, we, we have an opportunity, a responsibility uh, to really make a difference in this world. And, I, and, and we don't have to fight for it. It's actually in our hands. And I just want to encourage everyone to step into that uh, and, and make the difference. So I'll leave it there. Uh, and uh, hopefully, you know, we can feel the excitement as we read through the book. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, from my side, um, guys, also, thank you, Paul. It was a pleasure working with you um, and uh, with all the contributors. I mean, I, I, I realize that all of you are so incredibly busy and have so many other priorities. And, Thank you for taking the time and effort, making the time and effort to really contribute to the development of the profession as well. Um, uh, thank you so much. And then I want to see, are, are you still here? I want you to put quickly, quickly put on your screen where, there, there we are. Um, Sia is the mother of our publishing division. She runs that, um, th that whole department. Sia, thank you very much for your work hard work in putting the book together and um and well with all the other publications that you've put out and coordinating everybody it's like it's very much like herding cats um but nevertheless it's out we've got all the cats in the in in the crawl at the moment so that thank you very much to you and also tina for organizing the the launch so thanks a lot uh boozy who's putting the conference together for the two days to you as well and then, guys, um, to all the, the people who have uh, attended tonight, uh, thank you very much for, from, 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 from all of us. 
and uh, we hope you're going to support us in, in buying a few dozen of the books. So thanks a lot and great. Have a nice evening. Um, for those who are attending the conference, we'll see you tomorrow again. And uh, yes, um, let's, let's uh, grab this opportunity that the new world of work is uh, posing for us. Good night. And, Thank you. Uh, sleep well. Goodbye, Thanks, everybody. Everyone. Keep up. Take care. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.